Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Elena. Nice, nice to see everyone. OK, so I'm going to talk about the submitter versus the objector. Really, I'm going to talk mostly about being a submitter, but you get the contrast of the, the presentation. Um, so I really wanted to talk about this because you know, I've been practicing submissions since I was a child, but this is something that I feel, uh, mashallah, uh, but this is something I feel is such a deep uh, topic that I truly didn't understand. And still, you know, I'm still trying to grasp this concept um, now and much later in life. And, um, okay. So, we know from the Quran uh, in Surah 12, verse 103, that the majority of people do not believe. Most people, no matter what you do, will not believe. And then in 12, 106, the majority of believers is destined for hell. The majority of those who believe in God do not do so without committing idol worship. Okay, so these two verses are very profound because 12103 shows that majority of people that are in this world do not believe at all. And then 12106 are saying, is saying that the, of the people that believe in God, they don't actually believe in God because they pollute their belief with idol worship. Think about that. There's so many people that believe in God, but they actually commit idol worship and it shows that they don't really believe in God. So, uh, it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, my next slide is about. Um, so, is it there? Okay. Anyway, uh, okay. So basically, the Messenger of the Covenant um, talked about in one of his sermons. Uh, the Knowing God Sermon, which is God is running everything, God is doing everything. Um, he mentioned a, a submitter perspective, um, which was from February 1987. So I went back and kind of read this um, submitter perspective, and I actually found something really interesting. Um, it st first starts off with the verses that I read, which was 12.103 and 12.106, and then it lists the following verses, which is uh, 23.84 through 90. So I'm going to read these verses for you. It says, most believers destined for hell. Say, to whom belongs the earth and everyone on it, if you know? They would say, to God. Say, why then do you not take heed? Say, who is the Lord of the seven universes, the Lord of the great dominion? They will say, God. Say, why then do you not turn righteous? 2388. Say, in whose hand is all sovereignty over all things? And he is the only one who can provide help, but needs no help, if you know. They will say, God, say, where did you, where did you go wrong? And then uh, the footnote of that, of that little section says, Belief in God is valid only if one recognizes God's qualities, such as the fact that God controls everything, 817. Believers who do not know God are not really believers. Most believers nullify their belief by idolizing such powerless idols, as the prophets and saints, 6106. And then it also, uh, he also uh, put in the submitter perspective, 2961, which says, most believers destined for hell. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth and put the sun and the moon in your service, they will say, God, why then did they deviate? 2963. If you ask them who sends down from the sky water to revive dead land, they will say, God. Say, praise God, most of them do not understand. Um, so then later in the submitter perspective, it, it kind of uh, references those verses that I just read. And it says, there are only two possible alternatives. So there's only two possible alter alternatives in response to the above divine statements. Okay? So there's two things that we can reflect on. One, to assume that we are just fine and need not do anything. Two, to assume that we are not believers who have gone wrong somewhere and are heading for hell. So think about that. We, we, there's two ways you can think. You can think that, you know, I'm just fine. I'm, I'm doing my submission. I'm, I'm worshiping God. I believe in God. Or you can think, I'm heading for hell and I've gone somewhere wrong. What can I do to fix this? Needless to say, the second alternative is the wise one. For it would prompt us to carefully examine ourselves and possibly save our souls possibly save our souls. Our life in this world is our only chance to find the right 
uh, straight path. The fortunate believer will have to assume that he or she belongs with the majority of believers who have nullified their faith by falling in idol worship. Then do whatever is necessary to save himself or herself from the only unforgivable offense of idol worship. Unforgivable if maintained until death. So, just think about that. I mean, that kind of made me really reflect and, you know, I... You, you sometimes go with this mentality that, hey, I'm on the right path, I'm doing everything right, but really, you know, you can go wrong really easily. You know, the devil is coming at all of us all the time. He's, we are his main target. So it's very crucial, just like what 18103 says, which is examine yourself. We have to examine ourselves all the time. So this is kind of the meat and potatoes of my presentation. What is submission to God alone? So... Submission to God is, um, as you know, a description. According to verse 319, it's the only religion approved by God. And according to 4125, it is not a name, but rather a description meaning submission. Knowing God, okay? So... In 817, it says God is doing everything. It was not you who killed them. God is the one who killed them. It was not you who threw when you threw. God is the one who threw. But he thus gives the believers a chance to earn a lot of credit. God is here omniscient. The footnote says, Believing in God necessitates believing in his qualities, one of which is that he is doing everything. Without knowing God, there is no belief. Okay? Without knowing God, there is no belief. I mean, you have to really understand that. You have to know God's qualities, and if you don't know God's qualities as a, as a submitter, you don't really believe in God. Bad things are incurred by us and, and executed by Satan in accordance with God's laws. 4126. To God belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. God is in full control of all things. So if you are a believer... You, you have to know that no one is doing anything. If you believe anyone is doing anything other than God, that's actually idol worship. Because only God, according to 4126, he's the only one that's in control of all things. So I'm going to read a story about Joseph in 12.9. Joseph's fate already decided by God. So remember, you know, Joseph was, you know, very much loved by his father, and this caused some uh, resentment among his brothers, and they actually were trying to kill him. So 12.9 is kind of discussing that. It says, let us kill Joseph or banish him, that you may get some attention from your father. Afterwards, you can be righteous people. The footnote says, we learn from Joseph's dream that he was destined for a bright future. Thus, while his brothers met to decide his fate, so they thought, his fate was already decided by God. Everything is done by God and is already recorded. So think about that. You, you have this life, and you know Joseph had his life, and everything is already recorded. All we're doing is kind of following along in this story or this movie of our life or this storybook of our life. And they thought that they were going to kill him, but God didn't allow that. That just shows that God is actually doing everything. So we have to trust God in that. 1061, knowing God. You do not get into any situation, nor do you recite any Quran, nor do you do anything without us being witnesses thereof as you do it. Not even an atom's weight is out of your Lord's control, be it in the heavens or the earth, nor is there anything smaller than an atom or larger that is not recorded in a profound record. So God controls everything and everyone, and there's not even an atom's weight out of his control. You know? God, and you ha have to really think about God's qualities um, if you want to know God. Because remember, if you don't know God's qualities, you don't know God, and you essentially don't believe in God. And, you know, we have to think about, okay, God is perfect, and he never makes any mistakes. That's one thing we have to think about with his qualities. We know that God knows everything. No one else knows everything. Only God knows everything. He is the best protector. He is the best provider. He's the possessor of all power. 
So we have to really think about all of these qualities and, and truly believe them. Do you think that someone else can protect you? Do you think that someone else can provide for you? Do you think someone else is doing something? Do you think that someone else has power to benefit or harm you? So, so only God possesses these qualities. And as submitters, we, we have to really ingrain this in our mind and in how we think about everything. And we need to recognize all these qualities in order to make it. As submitters, do we carefully reflect on all these qualities? So, God controls everything and plans for the believers. 842. Recall that you were on this side of the valley while they were on the other side. Then their caravan had to move to the lower ground. Had you planned it this way, you could not have done it. But God was to carry out a predetermined matter whereby those destined to be annihilated were annihilated for an obvious reason, and those destined to be saved were saved for an obvious reason. God is here omniscient. So, if you think in your life that if I just do this thing or, or I'm able to do you know, something a certain way, I can do it. It's so wrong. I mean, 842 is just sh showing you that you know, they were, Prophet Muhammad was in a time of war and he really wanted, uh, they wanted to obviously win this war. But God is showing us a lesson that had they tried to do what they wanted to do, they would have failed. And God actually planned it in the perfect way that made them succeed. In 843, you'll see this. It says, God made them appear in your dream, O Muhammad, fewer in number. He, had he made them appear more numerous, you would have failed. And you would have disputed among yourselves. But God saved, saved the situation. He is knower of the innermost thoughts. So God actually made the people in, in, in the opposing army smaller in Muhammad's dream so that they could have more confidence by God's leave. And it just shows you God's awesome power, how he can influence us and help us. So what does submitting to God actually mean? As stated earlier, submission is not a name, it's a description. Submission is submitting to God under all circumstances. So not just sometimes, all circumstances. Which is vital if we want to be redeemed back to God's eternal kingdom. This means no complaining, no crying, no getting angry, no worrying, no anxiety, no fear, no grief, no annoyances, no frustration, and the list can go on and on and on. And as I said, um, the Messenger of the Covenant gave a sermon on this, the Knowing God sermon, and one thing that really stood out to me was that he said, as a believer, you have no business losing your temper. You are not a believer if you lose your temper, because this indicates that you are objecting to something God is doing. And then you know, submitting to God means that you accept everything that is happening to you and around you in this world. And, you know, that doesn't just mean that, like, you know, within what's going on in your own personal life. This could mean, like, something happening in politics or something happening at work or happening on the news. So, you know, as a submitter, you, you accept this. You accept everything that happens to you and around you. And we have to prove ourselves if we want to be proven worshipers. Two one fifty five. We will surely test you through some fear, hunger, and loss of money, lives, and crops. Give good news to the steadfast. The footnote says the test is designed to prove that we worship God under all circumstances. Okay, so if we really submit to God alone, if, you will not get angry at other drivers if they cut you off. How many of you guys sit in the car and then someone does something and go, why did he do that? What is he doing? What is she doing? What are you doing, right? This is an objection. You're objecting to what God is doing. God is doing everything. God put that car and allowed it to go in front of you. And when you complain, you're complaining to God. If you really submit to God, you will not panic if you are delayed for your appointment. Okay, sometimes there's some unforeseeable events Let's say you're trying to get ready, you're ready, but someone that you're going with is not ready, and you're like, oh, God, I'm going to miss my appointment. What, what's going to happen? <laughs> I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. <laughs> but that happens, you know? Like, and, and I feel like whenever we say something and proclaim something, you know, we, we proclaim these things, like, for example, for myself, that God is doing everything, and instantly you get put in that situation. Like, just like last week, I was like, oh, God, I'm going to miss my appointment. I was like, okay, God is doing everything. Calm down. You know that everything's already been written. 
There's, not, there's no point in objecting. It's already happened, it's okay. And I kind of, you know, reason with myself internally until I can kind of come to terms and be like, okay, I'm calm, I'm good. If you really submit to God, you will not roll your eyes at people who are on your nerves. In fact, they won't even get on your nerves to begin with. So think about all the people in your life, your boss, your teachers, your clients, your coworkers, your family, your friends. They won't get on your nerves when you believe God is doing everything. That person is saying something because God is allowing it. And it shows that if you really submit to God, you won't allow that person to get on your nerves. If you really submit to God, you will not have an about face when things aren't going your own way. So I actually had to look up what an about face was. It's actually, if you're in the military, you're kind of, you stand one way and then you put your feet like this and then you turn completely around. And it's kind of like a tactic to show, um, like for the army to, to quickly, you know, oppose the opposite direction. But it's interesting, they turn 180 degrees. So as a submitter, do you find that when you're in situations you know, you'll be fine, peaceful, and then something will happen and when you do a 180, all of a sudden you're, you're, you have rage, you're mad, you're, you're sad, whatever it is. As submitters, we have to have an even keel. This means we don't have a roller coaster of emotions, okay? You, and, and one thing that I thought is interesting, which I used to think about face meant, but you can show uh, you're objecting, not just by how you t uh, talk, but how you look. You know, a lot of communication is verbal communication, but even more of communication is actually our physical appearance, how your facial expression is, your posture, if you're calm. People can see this, the devil can see this, and you have to show with your face that you are a submitting face, you're a submitter. If you, are really, if you really submit to God alone, you will not complain or worry about your future. This includes living expenses, who will take care of you when you're older, or whether or not you'll be alone. So you need to realize that God is the one that is controlling everything and everyone, and if you do what God says, you seek God's kingship, everything else will fall in place in your life. Everything will be amazing. You might not be the, a billionaire, but God will see to it that all of your living expenses are taken care of. He will see to it that you will be taken care of. He'll see to it that you will have joy and happiness and not things that we think bring us joy and happiness. But we have to do our part by submitting to God and worshiping God and making sure we don't commit idol worship. So constantly tell yourself, God is doing everything. God is running everything. God is controlling everything. And that will help you. The responsibility is truly great. You know, just because we have the message does not mean that we are not responsible. We are more responsible because we have the full message than someone else who's on the street. Do you show as a submitter that you are different than people with your actions and your attitude? Greater miracles bring greater responsibility. 5114. Said Jesus, the son of Mary, our Lord, our, our God, our Lord, send down to us a feast from the sky. Let it bring plenty for each and every one of us and a sign from you. Provide for us. You are the best provider. The footnote says, The Quran's overwhelming miracle, Appendix 1, is described in 7, uh, 7435 as one of the greatest miracles and brings with it an uncommonly great responsibility. Uncommonly great responsibility. So submitting to God is a very deep and complex topic, and we know that, you know, trusting in God is not easy and takes place. Pract it, it takes a lot of practice. The devil will try his best to discourage you, and you must resist. Keep being steadfast and persevere. The faster we come to terms with what worshiping God entails, the faster we will enjoy a perfect life now and forever, as God promises his proven worshipers, 3186. But the catch is we have to prove ourselves. We cannot just say we're submitters, we have to prove we're submitters. And what if we do not submit to God under all circumstances? Then, by default, we are an objector. We are either submitting or objecting at any given moment. So are you a submitter or are you an objector? The difference between a disbeliever and a believer is that a believer submits willingly and a disbeliever doesn't. So when we're submitting to God alone and we call ourselves submitters, we have to submit to God 
under all circumstances, willingly. And uh, that's what 1315 says. And then, that's 1315. One thing I want to mention from the Quran is that we cannot just be part-time submitters. We learn that we cannot be a bad weather friend, nor can we be a fair weather friend. 30, 33, when adversity afflicts the people, afflicts the people, they turn to their Lord, totally devoting themselves to him. But then as soon as he showers them with mercy, some of them revert to idol worship. So God is so merciful and will give us um, all these blessings. But as soon as God gives us help and relieves any problems, you can revert to idol worship, which is terrible. Or fair weather friends, which says among the people, there is one who worships God conditionally. If things go his way, then he is content. But if some adversity befalls him, he makes an about face. Thus, he loses both this life and the hereafter, such as the real loss. Notice how it says you lose this life and the hereafter. So our submission to God and being redeemed is dependent on this aspect of, of submitting to God. If we don't submit to God, it, it shows that you really are not a believer. And I see that sometimes people are practicing submission for a long time, and yet they still have problems. And... It's very easy to complain, and you can get into a rut or a habit and not notice it. I mean, something as simple as saying, you know, why did so-and-so do this? Or why did you cook food when I'm wearing my nice clothes? Or, uh, you know, you, you hear, I, I find it funny how you always do X, Y, Z. You know, these are all complaining uh, statements, and we have to really be critical on ourselves because the devil will make a huge deal out of these little statements and say, see this person, they're not submitting to God, they're not a submitter. God, this person doesn't believe in all your qualities that you're doing everything. And on the last note, this is my final slide, uh, I want you guys to remember, seek God's kingship and everything else will follow in your life. You know, we have to submit to God alone and he will give us everything and more. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All right. So, um, starting with questions, we got a lot. Wow. Okay. I'm going to go to the people that haven't spoken, so you two are next. Awesome speech, Elena. Thank you. Um, okay. So, oh. guess who? <laughs> um, when you're, you like you described, like you get in a rut or you, it's like a habit or, you know, I notice that sometimes if it's like I'm complaining or objecting, it's kind of like a whole day thing. What um, do you recommend to do to break up that habit or break up that day? So I try to just stop and I will kind of reflect because sometimes when I do something, I like instantly feel bad. I'm like, well, why did I do that? And that's even objecting, right? And so I, I kind of just try to pause and then just think about everything I've done that day up until that point and just really make a firm repentance and try my best not to do it, do it at all for the rest of that day. Because, you know, you, you have unlimited opportunities until you die. The point is you have to prove yourself. So it takes good practice. Even though you might not have the perfect day, at least you can make the rest of that day a uh, day as you being submitting and, and being a submitter. Okay, Elena, so uh, similar question, but going back to where you were talking about knowing God, right? So knowing God's qualities, Mashallah, that was a very good point. My question to you is, if you are struggling with understanding one of God's qualities or applying it in your life, let's say that God is the only protector, what are mechanisms in which you, or things that you do in your life to kind of help you understand God's qualities better? So um, this is my understanding I feel like I didn't understand knowing God for a long time because um, probably like lack of soul growth. I think that growing your soul, you're able to um, understand these things better. Like for example, like knowing God is the best protector or knowing God is doing everything. When you grow your soul through the religious practices like doing your prayer and, and, and not complaining and objecting, when you do these things and you do real worship of God, you grow your soul tremendously. And I see a big change. Like before, I couldn't even get up for like dawn, for example. Mashallah, I'm, I'm a lot better in that department. And I think it's because, you know, your soul grows and you go through stage by stage. So that's kind of my answer. I would say grow your soul. And if you don't believe it right away, 
as, as a submitter, you accept it. You don't just say like, well, God maybe can protect me. You accept it. You say, no, God can protect me, but I have this weakness. So let me try to work on it. So you, you, tr you constantly try to get rid of your doubts and constantly try to, you know, really ingrain this into your, your mind and your soul. Mashallah, very, you know, great speech. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, freedom of choice, the choices that we make? Uh, whether, you know, God is making decisions and running everything. There are some submitters who think that we made a choice only once. That was uh, before we came to this world. And based on that choice, uh, all the decisions are made by God then after that. And uh, what are your thoughts on that versus we making choice every day of our lives? So... Um I believe that we make we do make one choice, which is to side with God or not, but we don't know that answer. We have to play it out in this life, and that's why God, you know, God knows the future, but we don't. You know, if, if God were to judge us um, without us going through this test in this life, then what would happen is we would say, wait, I didn't get my opportunity to show what I really feel. Mm -hmm. So I believe that just because, you know, God is doing everything God has already written everything down, doesn't mean that we don't have freedom. Of course, we have freedom to do whatever we like. So we make choices every day of our lives, whether it be with God or not. Yeah, we do make choices every day. Yes. Um, I think that they all reflect on our initial decision to side with God or not. Um, but that's how I see okay. it. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. An amazing speech, mashallah. A uh, very important topic. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could share your understanding in terms of how do we not object, but at the same time make a stand for the truth? Because I think this is quite a, an area where these two things can coexist sometimes, and it's quite uh, tricky for submitters and communities to kind of make that balance of, well, I don't want to object to this or that, but at the same time I need to make a stand for the truth and promote the truth and, 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 and not conceal the truth and only. Just wanted to get your views on that. Sure. Um, if I understand your question correctly, my advice would be to remain cool, calm, and collected. Uh, you know, like, just because, you know, we love God so much, if someone says something, it really can, like, get you, you know, heated. And at the same time, you have to re realize that God is doing everything but I would, I would just try my best not to get emotional because your points usually aren't as good when you're emotional and you could actually repel other people. So if you, I mean, like, just look at the messenger of the covenant in, in the great debate. He, he was calm when talking to that person who was saying nonsense, right? So I think that when we present the truth, we have to remember that. And even though it might bother us, we have to suppress our anger and go from there. But that's how I would do it. I just have one quick question. I'm a, I'm a little confused by the presentation to a degree, as in, are you suggesting that our emotions or reactions to certain events dictates if we believe if God is controlling something or it's not controlling something? Because, for example, in the Quran, in verse 4, verse 148, God says he doesn't like bad language unless you're faced with a gross injustice. I don't know anybody who will use bad language in a good mood unless they're a rapper or something, but right. most people tend to use bad language in the... Uh, expressing some kind of negative emotion or some kind of emotion that's contradictory to what's the events going on. So I'm kind of curious as this, what are you suggesting that I, someone needs to be always calm in every situation to say, to believe within themselves that God is controlling everything, so I'm going to be calm in everything? So how I see it is that there's verses in the Quran um, that help people who might be in a certain way, and he might let them know, hey, you, you have the past to do this because you have this weakness. So for example, I, I know that verse says that, you know, God doesn't love bad language unless treated with gross injustice, right? But as a submitter, I believe, you know, if you were to do that, it's okay. But I think that with practice of, of doing, uh, of realizing that God is doing everything, you won't even need to use bad language. I think that it's a process and it's not gonna happen overnight and God knows that. But I believe that, yes, we have to be calm all the time because this shows that we know God is doing everything. We know that God is running everything. This is part of knowing who God really is. So it's not like, like that, and, and even in that example, that's not like an everyday type of thing. That's a rare example that might happen to somebody. You know, gross injustice doesn't happen uh, often to people. And if it does, you know, um, I think that in that situation they would have an excuse, but God still 
uh, teaches us how to not even be in that case to use bad language. Great speech. Thanks. Okay.